There are some common problems I see when reading students' papers. Some of them are simple things you can immediately correct as soon as you become aware of them, so then you don't make the same mistake again. If this is something you're interested in, keep watching. And please don't forget to hit the subscribe and like buttons to help the channel grow and to be notified when new videos come online. When you write a paper at university, this is probably a new challenge for you, something you have not really encountered before. Because the way you write papers at middle school or high school is actually quite different, but you only realize this once you're confronted with new kinds of expectations. And even though this is a new challenge for you, the problem itself is not new. Students before you have struggled with it, and those coming after you will continue to struggle. And some of these problems are actually a matter of being aware of them, so they are easy to correct. And so here I thought I would mention seven mistakes, and I hope they will be useful for you. And just a quick caveat, this is not a comprehensive guide on how to write a paper. These are just some of the most common mistakes I have been correcting lately. So mistake number one is having no real conclusions. The conclusions are the punchline of a paper, a resolution to a problem presented in a way that is both obvious and powerful. Without them, your paper is only half done, even if you have written 95% of it, so it essentially remains unfinished. The conclusions are where you explain the main points of your study, what your analysis and discussions lead to. They are the place where you justify why you did all that research and why the reader did not spend her time in vain reading this. A typical reason for not having clear conclusions is that the paper is overly descriptive. It simply describes something in great detail or narrates a chain of events without trying to organize all this around a central problem. But writing a paper is like telling a story. You need to present a progression from a problem towards a solution. And all your discussion is there to support your point of view. Because good academic writing is about solving a problem, rather than describing something, no matter in how much detail. Your research is valuable only if it provides a solution to a problem. So your main challenge is actually to find a problem worth solving. So no matter how obvious the significance of your research seems to you, you should always sum it up and present your findings and explain how they contribute to solving your core problem. Mistake number two is not situating the study within the wider field. This is a problem related to the first one and it primarily pertains to your introduction and conclusions, which are the places where you have a chance to elaborate on how your research presented here is relevant for the larger field because a paper usually focuses on a specific topic, which is by default relatively narrow in scope. And this is supposed to demonstrate that you can go deep and do proper research and analysis. But at the same time, you also need to demonstrate that you can situate your research within the larger context of a discipline. That your research is meaningful, not only within the narrow confines of your specific topic, but also from the point of view of larger trends and interests. So while your paper itself focuses on a specific topic and dives deep into that set of problems, in the introduction and conclusions you also need to go wide and demonstrate how this research contributes to wider trends and even more important issues. Essentially, you need to connect your in-depth research to the wider field. And by doing this, you're selling it to a much wider audience. Mistake number three is not being aware of the bias in your sources. When you research your topic, you may find primary sources which provide context for your topic. They describe events around the same time and may even be the only source providing background information to your topic. Which is of course great because you need primary sources to understand what was happening, what the political and social background was to the story you're trying to tell. Yet you also need to take into consideration that your sources will have their own perspective. You could call it a bias, which is somehow a negative word, but every story has a bias because by default it has a perspective through which the author describes things. In fact, your own story will have a bias whether you like it or not. It will have its own perspective, and even though you're trying to back your arguments with facts, you're basically arranging everything in a way that supports your argument, your version of a story. So when you read about bandits sacking the city and inflicting great harm on the population, you also need to look at who's writing this, from whose perspective the story is told. Because what your source calls bandits 
Another source may call revolutionaries or freedom fighters. It may see the same event as a righteous uprising against injustice and tyranny. And what your source portrays as a massacre of innocents, another source may describe as a battle for justice, in which the heroes, despite being outnumbered by a hostile population, are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in their fight for a just cause. And the same goes for secondary sources, because there might be serious differences there too. For example, 20th century Chinese scholars may have a strong bias against Japan and Japanese scholarship, and may see many events in the past as resonating with China's experience during the 20th century. So their personal background and the times they live in may have a strong impact how they see the past. And of course, this is not limited to Chinese scholars, it's true for any country. So be aware of the inherent bias of your sources, especially the primary ones, which may be removed from us by several centuries. As a historian and researcher, you need to look at all this with a degree of impartiality, and at the very least, you need to be aware of the issue. And while it is arguable whether there is such thing as the truth, your argument in an academic paper is so much more powerful if it views the sources in a relatively objective manner. Mistake number four is not integrating your sources into your own narrative. This is a problem I keep running into, so I guess it's quite common. You acquire new information from books and articles, perhaps by underlining things or copying them out into a notebook. And as a result, initially, you may be thinking in terms of these bits. And so often in your own writing, you list one quote after the other. But it is a symptom that you have not internalized the knowledge. You're still organizing your thoughts in terms of these external bits of knowledge. And you tend to treat them as separate modules. And this betrays a certain degree of insecurity, as you feel that you cannot say it any better than it had been said by the authors. But I argue that you need to internalize the knowledge and make it your own. You need to digest it so you can remold it and make it part of your own narrative. You need to move away from the habit of listing your reading notes one after the other, and instead discuss the trends and issues relevant to your study. The sources should be supporting evidence rather than building blocks of a paper. If you present all this information in your own words from the point of view of the problem you're dealing with, this makes you feel much more confident and competent. And this, of course, will be true because you have internalized the knowledge and distilled them into several key issues. Mistake number five is not discussing the evidence. This point is related to the previous one and most often happens when you list one quote after the other. And because you're thinking in terms of these separate quotes, you treat them as building blocks to your paper. And because of this, you often don't discuss what the quote says. You just present it as evidence, thinking that it's obvious for everyone. And maybe it is, but you still need to integrate it into your paper and discuss its significance and relevance. And this may even be true if you're not quoting someone word for word, but you're paraphrasing their words. New evidence doesn't work on its own. It needs to be introduced and then discussed, so it's packaged properly. And if you're not doing this, this means that you have not internalized the knowledge, you have not made it your own, and so you still have work to do. Mistake number six is not being consistent with the bibliographic style. This is a matter related not so much to what you say, but how you present it on the page. This is about following a consistent bibliographic style. That is, the way you do footnotes and endnotes, the way you reference scholarship, the way you romanize foreign names, the way you mark page numbers, and so on. But also whether you put your comma before or after the closing quotation mark, whether you provide translations for titles of texts, or how you format your bibliography. All these things are strictly regulated in academia, and there are some very specific conventions. There are several accepted styles you can choose from, and some are quite different from the other, and also some fields may have their own preferences. But the most important thing is that you need to be consistent. You cannot do something this way here, and then two pages later do it in another way. You have to choose one style and then stick to it consistently. In practical terms, the easiest way to do this is to pick a book within your own field, published by a reputable academic press, and then just copy the way things are presented there. So whenever in doubt, you pick up that book and see how they handle something there. How the references are done, how the bibliography is arranged, everything. Because I know that you may think that this is not an important issue, 
And what really matters is what you write rather than how. But this is not the case in academia. This is a bit like a master chef who will not only spend the time to prepare a first class dish, but also make sure that it's served in an aesthetically pleasing way. And even though the food is not primarily about how it looks, it is nevertheless very important that it also looks great. When you write with lots of inconsistencies and do not follow a specific style, you're sending a message to the reader that you're a beginner and you don't know what you're doing. But you may also make it hard for the reader to understand certain things. We academics are used to having the style to guide us in reading. There are certain conventions and it might be genuinely confusing for the reader when those are violated. When I see a title in italics, I immediately know that this is a book title. And when I realize that in your case it's actually a title of a chapter, this is confusing. And if I realize this only a few pages later, I may need to go back and find a place and try to correct my understanding of what you wrote before, which can be annoying. So please make it easy for your readers and pay attention to how you present your research. It is important. Mistake number seven is relying too much on the same source. This is a common problem with undergraduate papers, especially in the beginning, when students go to the library and borrow one or two books and then proceed to write their paper based on those. And because we teach them to reference their sources, they keep referring to the same book. And it's very easy to see that they're basically going through the same book, paraphrasing whole sections of it. The result from the point of view of the reader is that your footnotes look the same only with incremental page numbers at the end. Essentially, this practice is moving towards plagiarism, and I definitely don't recommend going in that direction. Instead, you need a variety of sources, and if you're relying on a primary source for historical background, you should weave in your own assessment of this information and how it's relevant to your situation. So cite your sources to support your argument, but always build your story and use the sources only as supporting evidence. Okay, so these are seven common mistakes when writing a paper. There might be many others, but these are the ones I could think of right now. Let me know what your experience has been or how you managed to overcome some of these. Hope it was useful. Thank you for watching and see you next time.